Well, welcome to this talk on the subject of anaphylaxis. Now, people get very anxious very often when you mention the word anaphylaxis, and this applies to healthcare professionals, nurses and doctors, as well as patients and uh, family members of people who might suffer from this condition. Now, I don't want to undermine the importance and severity of the condition. But if it's properly managed, the outcome is usually very good. So this is a management problem. We need to manage this condition well. It's serious, but if it's well managed, we can normally expect a very good outcome indeed. Now, anaphylaxis can sometimes be caused by the patient being exposed to something in their day-to-day -day life of food or a medicine or, or an insect sting. But there again, it can occur in the hospital situation. And uh, Hippocrates of old said that we must do no harm. So if we are in any situation where there could potentially be any harm caused by our treatments, we need to be in a position to remedy that uh, as quickly as we can. And that does apply to anaphylaxis. So all nurses and doctors do need to, need to know about anaphylaxis. It's an essential cause, but as we say, also of interest to patients with allergies and, and their relatives. So it's a life-threatening, acute, allergic reaction. This is a, a, an allergic reaction. So anaphylaxis, if you like, is a subset of, of allergy. And it's acute. Acute means it comes on quickly. This is not a chronic condition. Although it can relapse, but the patient doesn't have anaphylaxis all the time, but they are at increased risk to it. But it's an acute presentation, typically within minutes typically within minutes, and it's potentially fatal, but it's not going to be because you're going to treat it properly. Uh, it's systemic and it's generalized. Now, this is not a localized allergic reaction. It is systemic. It's affecting the whole body. It's a systemic reaction. And it's allergic or hypersensitive. Now, some people do distinguish between anaphylactic reactions, which are allergic, mediated by immunoglobulin type E and uh, anaphylactoid reactions, which are the same, essentially the same reaction, but the, uh, the mast cells that release the histamine that cause the anaphylactic reaction are stimulated by something other than immunoglobulin type E's in an allergic reaction. But I'm not going to go further into that because the clinical features and the management are all identical. So we're going to just call it anaphylactic reactions, although technically uh, an anaphylactic reaction which is allergic is a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. And it's caused by the release of chemical mediators from mast cells. Now there's a type of white blood cell called basophils, although we don't normally see basophils in the blood. But when the basophils migrate into the tissues, they live in the tissues, they stay in the tissues as mast cells. And they are there to facilitate the inflammatory process. But hopefully that should only be done on a localised basis. So the inflammatory process is very important to facilitate local inflammation, to generate heat, pain, redness, swelling, loss of function. But of course, inflammation is the first stage in the healing process. It brings all the essential nutrients and oxygen to the area to facilitate healing. So inflammation is good, so it's good that mast cells are there. But the trouble is in anaphylactic reactions, that it's not just local mast cells that release their inflammatory mediators. It happens all over the body. So we get untold, I don't know, millions of mast cells all over the body, releasing their contents all at once, causing a systemic reaction. This is much more than a local reaction. It's affecting the, the whole body. So the release of these things from mast cells and basophils. Now, we can divide the clinical features into these four groupings, really. Cutaneous is affecting the skin and the mucous membranes, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, and as we'll see, to some extent, the gastrointestinal tract. So effects on the skin and the mucous membranes. Then there's the effects on the respiratory system, the effects on the cardiovascular system, and there's gastrointestinal features. 
and we could have included neurological features here but a lot of the neurological features are a consequence of the respiratory and cardiovascular features because if the brain's not getting a good blood supply if the brain's not getting enough oxygen then the brain is not going to work properly giving rise to neurological features now think about the cutaneous features first now 80 to 90 percent of cases in adults have some combination of cutaneous features so what do we mean here well what we're saying is uh, eight or nine times out of ten when you see an anaphylactic reaction there will be cutaneous features so usually the cardiovascular features the respiratory features are accompanied by cutaneous skin and mucous membrane manifestations in 80 or 90 percent of cases but you can get severe effects on the respiratory and cardiovascular system in the absence of cutaneous features that is possible so you may get cutaneous features or you may not but it's more likely that you will so it's a very useful diagnostic indicator but it's not essential because occasionally you'll get an anaphylactic reaction without the cutaneous features and as well as that you can get allergic cutaneous features like a, a rash or itchy skin which are not accompanied by problems of the uh, respiratory system and the cardiovascular system but most times the two are going to go together severe cutaneous features and the compromise of the uh, airway breathing circulation so what can we get flushing redness itching pruritus pruritus is just the medical term for itching urticaria are these intensely itchy wheels that can move over the surface of the body erythema as we said is red red uh, red coloring caused by the peripheral vasodilation it can affect the whole body um, sometimes called red man syndrome in the old days I have to say red person syndrome today and sometimes it just affects the neck uh, but you can get this redness so why it's so important to look at all the patient's uh, body surface area of course uh, there can be swelling in the angioedema angio is blood vessels this is a subcutaneous edema or, or an edema just under the uh, in the submucosa of the mucous membranes uh, it's not a pitting edema but it does cause does cause swelling so they're possible features angioedema for example can affect the lips the lips can become massively swollen the tongue can be massively swollen the mucous membranes around about the mouth and, and it can affect the uh, the structures at the back of the throat as well in the oropharynx and the larynx which of course is going to cause severe uh, airway compromise or potential airway compromise as we'll notice shortly so 80 to 90 percent of cases with cutaneous features absence of cutaneous features doesn't mean it's not anaphylaxis but cutaneous features can occur on their own now respiratory features um, you can get the normal allergic sort of things uh, runny nose congested nose uh, sneezing coughing the sort of things you would expect but I find it useful to think about the respiratory effects in two areas the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract so in the upper respiratory tract there can be swelling caused by the angioedema and this can lead to throat tightness the patients are panicking it's terrifying because they feel the throats are closing up and they're right they are the swelling can massively reduce the available lumen through which air can go through this can give rise to hoarse voice stridor which is noisy breathing from the upper airway but the wheezing of course is a lower um, respiratory tract feature caused by bronchoconstriction so there can be upper airway swelling closing off of the upper airway and there can be bronchoconstriction bronchoconstriction of the lower airways reducing the bronchial lumen meaning that it's more difficult for the air to get to the alveoli so upper airway and lower airway of course that causes difficulty in breathing shortness of breath there can be a compensatory tachypnea which is rapid breathing but the oxygen saturations can drop there can be cyanosis although i really hope you treat it before it gets to that stage 
um, the hypoxia can lead to confusion and uh, th there can be respiratory arrest. So these are the respiratory features. The upper airway features caused by the swelling, the uh, histamine induced vasodilation and the lower respiratory features caused by the histamine induced bronchoconstriction. So histamine is, is a vasodilating bronchoconstrictor. That's why it causes such severe respiratory uh, potential life-threatening features. Cardiovascular features. Well, as we've said, histamine is a vasodilator. So if we're going to vasodilate, that's going to reduce peripheral resistance. If we reduce peripheral resistance, we're going to reduce blood pressure. So there can be shock, a state of acute hypotension, which results in reduced tissue perfusion. When the blood pressure is not sufficient to perfuse the tissues of the body, that is shock. And the patient will be pale and clammy. Hypotension, as we've said, the blood pressure will be low. And normally we'll find that the heart tries to beat faster to compensate for that, a compensatory tachycardia. So we would normally expect the heart rate to be fast. If there's reduced perfusion of the brain due to cerebral, hypo, cerebral hypoperfusion, reduced perfusion of the brain due to re reduced blood pressure, especially if that's accompanied by hypoxemia, low levels of oxygen due to respiratory problems, there can, then there can be reduced levels of consciousness as a result of cerebral hypoxia. Uh, there can be chest pain because if the blood pressure is very low, that means the blood pressure of the blood perfusing the coronary arteries is also low. And that can lead to an acute myocardial hypoperfusion as a result of coronary arterial hypotension. And this can actually cause angina type myocardial ischemic pain, even in people that don't have ischemic arterial disease already. And of course it can lead to cardiac arrest as a result of hypoperfusion of the myocardium. But of course you're going to treat it way before that, that stage. Gastrointestinal features. Um, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and there can be incontinence of feces as well. Again, caused by the inflammatory mediators in the histamine because we, we said they affect the skin and the mucous membranes. And of course, the gastrointestinal tract is entirely lined with the mucous membrane. Neurological features. Now these patients are usually terrified, a terrifying condition, so they're often very restless and anxious. They can be kind of all over the place, which isn't surprising, but you need to calm them down because you are going to definitively treat them. Headache, dizziness due to cerebral hypoperfusion, blurred vision, again I assume that's due to the lack of blood supply to the, um, the visual cortex in the brain primarily. Sometimes a metallic taste in the mouth, that's like a chemical effect from the allergy. And, and this, this bizarre medical uh, saying, feeling of impending doom, it means the patients feel that they are about to die. They are terrified. And it's part of the condition that, that it causes anxiety. But the anxiety is also caused by cerebral hypoperfusion. Whenever there's a reduced blood supply to the brain, that causes anxiety as well. So this feeling of impending doom. So we really do need to reassure these patients because they're in an awful situation, but, but we, can, we can manage it. So neurological features. Now, how common is this condition? Well, I think what I'd like to say here is there's a complete spectrum of conditions from, from very severe uh, anaphylactic life-threatening conditions to um, moderately severe allergic conditions to just irritating allergic conditions. So th there can be a complete spectrum of manifestations here. Anaphylaxis is just the extreme end really of this continuum, although it is a separate condition in its own right because, because if it's an acute onset and it's life-threatening uh, nature. 
uh, but the prevalence of anaphylaxis itself here we're, we're talking about now the epidemiology is not good and the global global epidemiology is not well correlated on the incidence of anaphylaxis but um Lifetime prevalence in Europe, they say about 0.5 to 2% of the population will have an anaphylactic reaction at some point in their life. Some studies say up to 3% of the, of the population. And uh, between 30 and 950 cases per 100,000 person years. So there's a heck of a range, isn't it? But, but that, that, that is the current range published by the British Resuscitation Council. So in a town of 100,000 people, you can expect to see 30 to 950 cases per year, which doesn't really tell us too much. In my experience, it's probably somewhere between those two. Um, hard to tell because some are managed in the community by, by relatives, others are admitted to hospital. But once someone has had an anaphylactic reaction, they're much more likely to have another. There's a significant risk of recurrence. So these patients need to wear Medi-Alerts saying, I am allergic to whatever it is. They need to carefully read food labels. They probably need to carry an EpiPen. Epi, short for epinephrine, which is adrenaline, which as we'll see is the, the life-saving treatment uh, if an anaphylactic reaction occurs. So unfortunately, some people are just predisposed to this condition. And once they've had it once, they're probably going to get it again, unfortunately although great care needs to be taken to try and prevent that. So predispositions, who's more prone to it than other, than other people? Well, atopy is described as the predisposition to make immunoglobulin type E's to everyday antigens. We're supposed to make immunoglobulin type E's to viruses and bacteria, but people with atopy can produce them in response to peanuts or shellfish or milk or cow's milk or everyday substances. So some people are atopic and they may suffer from asthma, allergic rhinitis and other food allergies. So these people are slightly more at risk. Uh, some data says that children up to the age of four are more at risk of anaphylactic reactions. Uh, other data shows that uh, older people, um, 60s, 70s, 80s, are more prone to anaphylactic reactions. Uh, it's been correlated with lack of vitamin D. So people that are low on vitamin D may be more prone to anaphylactic reactions. And people that have not been exposed to significant antigenic challenge, especially in early life, may be more prone. This is the idea of healthy dirt, the hygiene hypothesis, that we need to expose the immune system to bacteria. And indeed, some pe people say to, to uh, larger parasites like worms, uh, gastrointestinal parasites, for example, in order to uh, educate the immune system to recognising that which is potentially harmful and that which is not pot potentially harmful. So children that have been kept too clean uh, may be more at risk. There's also evidence that shows that people get less allergic problems when they've been exposed to animals, again, especially in early life, cats, dogs, sheep. Um, the back, um, animals carry such a wide variety of bacteria is really going to stimulate a child's immune system in a positive direction. Now, the pathophysiology here. Well, what happens is someone is exposed to an antigen. Let's say, let's say it's a peanut for, for sake of argument. So they're exposed to a peanut and because they have made, because they're exposed to the, the peanut, they make antibodies to it. Now they're not supposed to. They're supposed to make antibodies to viruses and bacteria, but by mistake, they failed to immunologically tolerate the peanut. So they made antibodies to that, uh, to that peanut protein. And these antibodies will float around in the blood for a while, but the antibodies attached to the, uh, the immunoglobulin type E antibodies attached to the mast cells. And uh, that sensitizes the mast cells. And then the next time that someone is exposed to the antigen, which is now an allergen because it causes allergy, the peanut antigen or the peanut allergen will stick to the antibodies on the surface of the mast cell. And when the antigen, the peanuts in this case, which is acting as an allergen, stick to the immunoglobulin type E's on the surface of the mast cell, that sends messages through the, 
through the antibody into the mast cell and causes the mast cell to split open and degranulate. The mast cells reform but they release all their granules containing uh, mast cell tryptase, histamine particularly, you know, prostaglandins and, and other inflammatory mediators that all go into the blood. But this happens all over the body. So there is mass degranulation of mast cells. So in anaphylaxis there is mass degranulation of mast cells all over the body. And it's just like giving an intravenous bolus dose of these inflammatory mediators. The blood levels of these things go all right up. And that's what causes the bronchoconstriction. That's what causes the vasodilation and the fluids to leak out causing the swelling and the features of anaphylaxis and it drops the blood pressure as a result of the histamine induced peripheral vasodilation particularly at the level of the arterioles which is where most of the vascular resistance is in the systemic arterial system so triggers foods medications insect stings and venoms and the other one that's become more common lately is latex as well let's look at these in a, in a little more detail so um, foods there are a few of the foods that uh, pretty well that list is in order of uh, how common the condition is um, cow's milk allergy tends to affect young children they can grow out of that sometimes but other things like eggs peanuts uh, hazelnuts all sorts of nuts really fish particularly uh, crabs lobsters shellfish people can be allergic to uh, sesame seeds as well there's, there's been some recent publicity about tragic uh, tragic death uh, as a result of exposure to sesame seeds so food causes and as well as that every time someone's re-exposed to the substance that they're allergic to which is now acting as an allergen and that can actually stimulate the uh, immunoglobulin type E production and, and, and that means the next reaction can become even worse. So this can actually get worse as time goes on with increased sensitization if someone's mistakenly exposed to it. And processed foods can contain so many food components uh, that people can eat something like peanuts without realizing they're, they're eating them. I remember a tragic case once of, of a, a young guy who was out in the fields eating a chicken sandwich and he died of peanut allergy and it transpired that what happened is someone had been making peanut butter sandwiches before they made the chicken sandwiches and even though the, the knife was wiped clean there was still enough peanut protein on the knife that they made the chicken sandwiches with to cause the anaphylactic reaction and cause death so very small doses are needed if someone is fully anaphylactic allergic to a substance there's been other cases of what's called kissing anaphylaxis so um so, so like a uh, boy eats peanuts a few minutes later boy kisses girl girl has anaphylactic reaction to to peanuts just through very small doses of peanut in, in saliva so cross-contamination, very important message for the catering industry that uh, such small amounts, uh, there's been quite a few cases of peanuts in curries uh, where, where you wouldn't expect peanuts to be but there they were and, and they, they do sometimes tragically, um, tragically cause death. Medications. Um, the, the worst medications for this are anaesthetic agents, particularly muscle relaxants like succinothonium and the, um, the vancuronium type muscle relaxants, but anaesthetists know all about that. Um, aspirin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, parenteral penicillin, that's injections, um, plasma, streptokinase, we don't use much that these days, although I, I, I was actually gave streptokinase when it first came out in, in the late 80s and didn't see an anaphylactic reaction, thankfully. But it, 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 it is known for it. Although these days we tend to use more sophisticated preparations like TPA, uh, tissue plasminogen activator, and other thrombolytic agents. Uh, dextran, contrast media, things that contain iodine, blood. But potentially any medication, really. Um, we always have to be aware of it. And every single time before we give every single medication, we ask the patient if they're allergic to it. 
So every time before I give any medication, have you got any allergies? And if they have, we write it in big red letters on the notes, but I always ask every single time, any allergies? Can't be too careful. Always ask for allergies. Check the name of the patient, check the date of birth of the patient, give the right dose of the right drug to the right patient at the right time via the right route, and always check for allergies. We sometimes call it birthdays and allergies. <laughs> birthdays and allergies. So name of the patient, full name of the patient, birth date of the patient, and if they have any allergies. Every time. Birthdays and allergies. Every time. The time you miss is the time you can be caught out. Right, remove, stop the cause, of course, if possible. So if it's blood, of course, you're going to stop it. If it's plasma, of course, you're going to stop it. Um, if it's food, we don't certainly spit out what's in the mouth. Absolutely, 100% spit that out. But we don't recommend inducing uh, vomiting. Bee stings can be taken out. The, the, the bee st Wasp stings aren't a physical thing, but uh, they're an in injection of chemical. But bee stings, there is a physical bee sting that can, be, that can be pulled out. So stop, remove the cause as soon as possible, if feasible to do so. Management strategies, of course, is airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure. So keep the airway patent, make sure the patient's breathing with oxygen. Make sure the circulation's okay, check their neurological status and expose the patient so we can examine them all over, all over. And this is particularly important that we do this because we don't need to give aggressive treatment if the patient's just got a rash. But if the patient's got compromise of airway or breathing, then we do. Again, if the patient's just got a rash or a runny nose or itchy eyes, we don't need to give aggressive treatment. But if the patient is tachycardic and hypotensive, tachycardia and hypotension, certainly we do. Or if they've got a neurological problem as a result of cerebral hypoperfusion or cerebral hypoxia, certainly we do. And then we need to expose the patient to see what's going on. Non-life-threatening conditions, so this is not a faint, it's not a vasovagal. Now, we could talk a lot about the differential diagnosis, but in a faint, basically the patient becomes bradycardic for a period of time. In anaphylaxis, they become tachycardic. Uh, in anaphylaxis, there may be airway compromise. In a faint, there is not airway compromise. So do you see why we need to check A, B, C, D, E? If we do it systematically, we're not going to get mixed up. We're not going to confuse a panic attack with an anaphylactic reaction. Because in a panic attack, of course, the patient will be tachycardic, as in anaphylaxis. But the point is, in a panic attack, the blood pressure will be high. In a panic attack, there's not going to be any bronchoconstriction and bronchospasm. Therefore, there's not going to be a wheeze. So the patient's not going to have a wheeze. In a panic attack, the oxygen saturations would be normal or above normal, very often 100%, because the patient's hyperventilating. If there was airway compromise in an anaphylactic uh, attack, then the patient would be hypoxic. The oxygen saturations would be low. So if we go through airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure, logically every time, we're not going to make silly mistakes. That means we're not going to miss cases of anaphylaxis and we're not going to treat panic attacks as anaphylaxis. We're going to get it right because we do it systematically. Breath holding in children and sometimes idiopathic uh, allergic or urticarial reactions can occur with, even with angioedema. Um, that, then we would only treat that if the angioedema was causing airway compromise. So really what we're checking is airway, breathing, circulation. We're treating those first. Do it systematically. It's not hard, but you've got to do it systematically. Supportive management, airway management if necessary. High flow oxygen, absolutely. Just give them oxygen, that's absolutely fine. High flow oxygen. The more oxygen that's going to the uh, brain, the better. The more oxygen that's going to the myocardium, the better. If the myocardium is well oxygenated, it's going to be much less irritable. Therefore, there's going to be a greatly reduced probability of cardiac arrest if the myocardium is well oxygenated. So high flow oxygen, monitor anything you can, whatever facilities you've got, um, cardiac monitoring, pulse oximetry, any monitoring equipment you've got, use it. 
gain intravenous access as soon as possible. Fluid resuscitation with crystalloid solutions, there's no advantage to giving colloidal solutions. And the position of the patient, well if the patient's shocked they need to be lying down with the legs up, uh, with the head down, but there again some patients, if breathing is the main problem, that, that they can breathe much better when they're sitting up. Medical management, well, if uh, a line is available, that then run some fluid in quickly, that's good of course, because, because in the vasodilation, the arterioles are going to vasodilate, that's going to drop the blood pressure, but the capillaries also vasodilate, and that's going to increase the permeability of the capillaries, so a lot of the intravascular volume will go into the interstitial spaces. That will cause swelling, it's really a form of third spacing but it will also leave the patient hypovolemic. Um, but really probably I should have put adrenaline at the top of this list because it's adrenaline's a life-saving feature. In adults it's 0.5 mils, that's uh, 0.5 milligrams of 1 in 1000 adrenaline. Give it into the thigh, deep intramuscular ejection, nice big needle, get it right into the muscle. We want it to act quickly, subcutaneous is too slow, we don't give it intravenously. Now, if you're a clever consultant watching this video, well, you shouldn't need to watch it anyway, um, but if you're a clever consultant, you can give uh, intravenous adrenaline. For the rest of us, absolutely not. Nurses, junior doctors, out of hospital, the adrenaline is always intramuscular. Adrenaline is epinephrine in, in the States. It's exactly the same thing, it's just another name. Annoying that we have two names, but we have. So epinephrine, 0.5 milligrams IM would also be the treatment. And uh, repeat that after five minutes if there's no effect. Usually there is. Um, some people aren't as adrenaline sensitive, particularly if people are on beta blockers, uh, can be a problem. But there again, patients who are predisposed to anaphylactic reaction should not be prescribed beta blockers in the first place, really. Uh, intravenous uh, hydrocortisone, 200 milligrams given slowly. Uh, studies show, well, and it's, more, it's more expert opinion, really, indicates that there's no advantage giving higher doses. Um, intramuscular injection or slow IV. I would always give it slow IV if possible. Uh, chlorpherenamine, uh, antihistamine, 10 milligrams, again, IM or slow IV. And uh, bronchodilators, uh, subutamol nebulizers would normally be my first, first line approach. Um, with that, the patient should do very well. They should do very well. Always keep these patients for at least six hours preferably 12 hours, ideally 24 hours, because a minority of patients have what we call biphasic reactions. So they have an anaphylactic reaction, it gets a bit better, but then it comes back again. Uh, so basically the rule of thumb here is don't discharge these patients till a senior doctor says they can be safely discharged. We don't want unsafe discharges. Don't want the patient collapsing on the way out of the hospital doors. It's happened before. Make sure not on your shift. So there we go, anaphylactic reactions. Potentially frightening, but with good management, the outcomes are nearly always good. The tragedies occur away from medical help or away from available uh, medications such as adrenaline. And as long as you take your time, diagnose this properly, have a consistent airway, breathing, circulation are they compromised treat those first disability exposure if the airway breathing and circulation aren't compromised then you don't need aggressive treatment they just might need some chlorpheniramine tablets if they are compromised then adrenaline is the life-saving drug because histamine is bronchoconstricting and vasodilating adrenaline is bronco dilating, vasoconstricting. And adrenaline will also help to stabilize the mast cells and um, actually sort of really abort the attack. And the adrenaline needs to be given as soon as you are sure of the diagnosis. Giving adrenaline at an early stage uh, is a very good prognostic indicator.